child as is.
Once again, good morning, friends. And Merry Christmas to you. I'd like to just start by saying this. Where's Larry sitting? Is Larry back there counting? That's all right. He's working. You know, I wish he could hear this, but I'd like, I, I'll say it for everybody to hear. And, and uh, Marlene, you can tell him. I, I love Larry for so many reasons. But one of, the, one of the greatest things I admire about Larry is that he believes in the children. <laughs> hey, praise God. Praise God that he believes in regional. And I want to have that same conviction in my heart and all our hearts. Amen. You know, it's different this morning. It's the Sunday before Christmas. And I'm learning over the years of pastoring, if you do something special the week after a special event, nobody's into it. <laughs> you know? So my, I'm a little bit behind, and I'm a, you know, why do it today when I can put it off for later? So I would do Christmas next week. But you know what? Today's the day. And I feel like celebrating Christmas today with y'all and we're going to do things a little bit different today. It's a Christmas day, amen? I know it may not feel like Christmas outside because it's wet and it's raining. But I know God's got something special in store for you. And you know what? As we were sitting there singing those precious carols of Christ, I begin my old rich heart, begin to feel some Christmas cheer and joy coming into it, amen? Today you're going to get something that you won't rarely get from me. Three points and a poem. <laughs> I know that's the way most pastors come about it, but that's not the way God wired me. But today I want to do something different in the spirit of Christmas, and I want to give you three points and a poem. Our first place is going to be in Luke chapter 2. Father, as we begin to open your word, I pray you open our hearts to hear from you. Lord, we celebrate this tremendous event that took place so long ago that defined reality and shaped the world and the world's destination is, is influenced and determined by that event of your arrival. Father, I pray you begin to open our hearts to see the magnitude of of what has been enacted with that first advent. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Something that's been heavy on my heart for some time, we were talking about it in prayer, me and some of the brothers, and I've shared with you through different times in sermons and messages and just in prayer, about what's on my heart concerning the disrespect for God that is being vocalized and being lived out and displayed in our culture and our society today. And you, you can see a rampant decline in, in morality as people throw off any fear of God Almighty. But I want you to understand the gospel from not just the perspective of men. Because too often we look at the gospel even as conservatives, even as believers, even as evangelicals, and when we approach the gospel, we come to it from a man-centered perspective. What does it mean for us? What does it do for us? And, and it's, we look at it about us. But if you look at the gospel from the New Testament throughout the whole Bible, the Bible, the New Testament, especially the gospel, is not man-centered, but it's theocentric in its essence. That is, it's all about God. So as we look at Christmas, and we celebrate the gift that we received, I want us to remember the one that gave, and the bigger picture of the gospel. 
in the Christmas message. Now, as we start off, and I promise I'll keep them short and sweet because it's three points and a poem, remember? As we start off in Luke's gospel, I won't read the whole section. I'm going to look at verse 14. You know the story. The shepherds are minding their own business. They're keeping their flock. And lo and behold, the angels appear. And the angel gives them the message of the Savior in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And when you skip on down to verse 14, those original messengers, it's almost as if heaven opens up to the shepherds and, and they can see backing up the vocal and the message of those angelic beings is a whole heavenly host. Now I'll tell you, it does not say so in Luke's Gospel. And so when I reference it, know that it's only in my imagination and not in the Bible, but I just picture that heavenly host singing. <laughs> it does not say that they're singing, but I believe that there's a, there is a singing going on. When we come to verse 14, I believe this is being sung out. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Whew. The first thing I want you to see about a God-centered, theocentric gospel is that it all begins with embassy. The God of heaven. The God of glory. The God of all eternity. The Holy One is reaching down to sinful man and sending His own Son manifest in that time and place to be a Savior to the world. And he's reaching out and the whole idea is good will to men who have rejected God. The first idea of a God-centered Christmas and Gospel message is God's good will to men. He's sending embassy from heaven to earth. Because the two are at war. Wow. Embassy. God's goodwill. He's reaching out. He's reaching out. But if you'll notice in that very proclamation from the onset of the Gospel, here at the beginning of the pages, of St. Luke's story, we see the idea this is bringing glory to God. There's another point I want to make. You'll find it in Romans chapter 16. That wonderful letter to the Romans written by St. Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit when it comes to its conclusion and the beautiful doxology is given we read these words in Romans 16 and verses 25 through 27 now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest by the Scriptures and the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through 
Jesus Christ forever. Amen. The next point I want you to notice about a God-centered gospel is intent. Intent. What is God's intent when He sent Christ to the world? Certainly, redemption was at the forefront of His purposes. But there was an ultimate and even greater outcome than redemption. And that is glorifying His holy name throughout the ages. You see, it's through Jesus Christ and the testimony of the Gospel and the work that He's accomplished that God is and will be forever glorified. Amen. So we have embassy. God's goodwill to man. We have intention. His eternal glory. And I want you to see one more. Go all the way to Revelation chapter 15. In Revelation chapter 15, we come to a time frame in the perhaps not so far future. When God is returning to, to the world the things that the world deserves. And we read about the plagues and the judgments of God. We also read about how the world is becoming ever intensely increasing in their animosity towards the people of God. In fact, there's a multitude here in this chapter in heaven. And this isn't just all the saints in heaven. This isn't just all the saints of old, but this multitude are the saints that came through their life and death struggle with none other than Antichrist. And there, on the other side of the battle, on the other side of this world and this life and this existence, when they fought the good fight, when they were executed for their faith, they laid down their life for their beliefs, they are in heaven, and they've got this to say about the whole scheme of things. I'm going to pick up in verse 2, but we're really looking for 3 and 4. As I saw, I saw as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having harps of God. Now, if you ever wonder if they're singing in heaven, you need only to go to Revelation. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And I want you to see the words that they add to these. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And I want you to see the third point this morning about a God-centered gospel. Inevitable, eternal outcome. When God set in motion redemption through Jesus Christ by sending His Son to this old world, it was an act of embassy and goodwill from God. 
But he had ultimate intention in it. Eternal glory through Jesus Christ. And it will one day climax in an unavoidable, inevitable outcome. Mainly the manifestation of all God's just doings and purposes. You see, the whole world and all of heaven and all of creation, when it all comes about and this thing winds down, everybody is going to know just how glorious our God really is. He planned it that way. When He created a world that had potential for sin, He created a good and perfect world, but He gave us free will. He knew from the beginning before He ever called anything into existence, He had already purposed to send His Son to die for you and I. And He'd already saw the end and His ultimate glory and all that He planned and purposed. I know it's a lot to take in for a Christmas service, but I want you to remember it starts with His embassy towards us. It involves His intention. It reaches its inevitable outcome. With that said, I want to share with you a Christmas poem. I told you I was going to keep it short and sweet. You said you're getting it short, but it ain't so sweet, but it, <laughs> it is. I put this poem in relation to those angels that Luke don't say that they are singing. But in my mind, they are. But I want you to know that every line of this poem, other than the fact that I say that the angels are singing, every line is directly connected to portions of Scripture and biblical truth. So I titled it, Glory to God. God sent His own Son to be born in a stable. Not what we choose for our own were we able. He, the Eternal, entered space-time to a humble destination full of real muck and grime. What was the welcome for heaven's high king? Shepherds and wise men and angels that sing? Glory to God was the angelic song. All heaven joined in as they chorused along. What could this mean to the people of earth? Could a king really come from such humble birth? A vicious old ruler, a flight from the danger. This is how the world welcomed its divine stranger. Christ wasn't without fanfare at times, but people are often of wishy-washy minds. Hosanna's one day and just a few later, Away with this man. To them, he was traitor. Christ valued not what the people hold dear, like silver and gold or man's praise in their ear. The world can abide the righteous. Didn't you know? There was only one answer to the cross. He must go. They beat him and nailed him and hung him dying in pain. But a life such as he is, is not given in vain. With his own life's blood, he atoned for our sin. But death could not hold him. He was risen again. This is the gospel calling us to faith and repentance. For Christ will return and give out his sentence. 
to the unbelieving, bowed with their own sin and hate, at the feet of the Savior, awaiting their fate. They'll confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, filled with regret for the salvation they ignored. The confession for them comes a little too late. It won't save their soul. It won't change their fate. It's the return of something these sinners had robbed. By confessing Christ as Lord, they give glory back to God. All throughout heaven, the angels and saints give glory to God with free hearts that won't faint. The sinners and devils below, unrepented, give glory to God by the words they've admitted. By redemption or judgment, God's glory is the same. It always comes through that most worthy name. How you'll glorify God is your choice to make. But never forget, there's a terrible lake. It burns with the flames of God's holy wrath. The sad fate of all who choose the broad path. Do not despair. There's hope still for you. Make Jesus your Lord and your Savior too. Bow your heart to the Lord. Call on His name. Jesus only can save you from the torment and the flame. And when you own Jesus as Savior and King, all glory to God is the song you will sing. Friends, when we look at the totality of the revelation of God, what He set into motion on that day He sent Christ was to give men a beacon of hope and opportunity, but sealing the fate of all those who reject Him. It was the declaration of embassy. He extends His goodwill, His desire that all might be saved, but ultimately God in His divine purposes knows that the hardened hearts of men and women throughout the ages, that many will not come to faith in Jesus Christ and so will be damned. And the reality is that that gift of Christ, that child in the manger so long ago, set the wheels of history into motion and the gears of God's purposes marching down to the final day when all His plan culminates in glory and all the angels and the saints and the demons and the sinners, they all recognize with one open mind, God is glorified and we receive what we deserve. Friends, this isn't what you expected for Christmas, was it? I want you to understand. This is a gift that God has given to us beyond all other gifts. And to neglect it. That is to despise our own souls. I'm going to ask you to stand. Praise team to come. Maybe you're here today. And you've celebrated Christmas all your life. But you never considered that the child in the manger, he determines your destiny. There's not a soul on earth that ever lived that will be able to say when they stand before God Almighty on that judgment day that they don't deserve His judgment. In sending Christ, God 
has given every soul a chance to be saved. How about you? In the poem, those that are at judgment and they know what's coming and they know what to say. Jesus is Lord. But there's no more opportunity. Maybe you're here this morning. You're not ready to face eternity. You're not ready to face the judgment of God. And you've never accepted the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And this morning, as we celebrate Christmas, God's extending that gift to you. And I say, friend, don't be one of those who the only way they can glorify God with their life is in their own eternal damnation. Glorify Him now. Make Christ your Savior and your Lord. Maybe you're here and you know you've been saved. You know you belong to the Lord. But you viewed life is mostly about you. Too often as Christians, we fall into this category. But when we look at the New Testament, we see a different picture. You see, our life is all about Him. Maybe God's calling you this morning to see the world from a different perspective. God at the center. If the Lord's speaking to you this morning, we're going to have an opportunity.